sir. Whoo, I'm sweating. I didn't think I was going to get that mic in time. Holy cow. How you guys doing tonight? Great. Fantastic. 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 I just wanted to start out tonight uh, with a question. I like to do that a lot. Hi, Kara. I saw that little wave. Uh, I just wanted to start out with a question tonight. I like to do that um, pretty often on a Wednesday night. And my question is this, is like, have you ever made a decision that you immediately regretted? Like I'm talking about like the second you finished doing it, you were like, I can't believe I just did that. I cannot believe I made that decision. That was the worst thing I could have done. Let me tell you about two that I've made in the past week, okay? Two of them I made in the past week. They did not go so well for me. Thought they were great ideas. At the time, I was 100% sure I was all in. I was like, this is what I'm about. And five seconds later, I paid the price. First one is this. Somehow, all of my bad decisions seem to... Uh, uh, seem to have to do with food. Somehow they seem to have to do with food. Um, and, and, and oftentimes it can be like, I want to try something and I don't like it. That's not what these are. No, my first one was, I'm a big pizza guy. I want pizza anytime I can get my hands on some pizza. And the problem is, Emma is not a big pizza guy or a big pizza girl. She doesn't want pizza. And so all the time I'm like, hey, you know what I would love for dinner tonight? we should order in some Domino's. And she's like, nothing sounds worse than some Domino's right now. Well, here's what happened the other day. I had a really long day. I didn't eat lunch. It was like nine o'clock. We were like, man, every place is closed for dinner. It's either McDonald's or Domino's. Can we please do pizza? And she was like, all right, let's do it. And I got myself a pepperoni and pineapple pizza. My personal favorite. Yes, yes. Pepperoni, yes, yes. Let's hear it. Let's hear it, yes. Pepperoni and pineapple is the combo that cannot be beat. Now, that is not the decision that I lived to regret. Here's where the decision starts to go poor. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I didn't eat lunch. It's 9 o'clock. I decide I'm about to sit in my bed and eat the entirety of this pizza in about 10 minutes flat. See, because she won't eat. She won't eat pepperoni pineapple pizza. She has her own pizza to eat. I'm laying in bed with a full medium-sized Domino's pepperoni pineapple pizza, and I down the entire thing. There is nothing less or nothing left in about 10 minutes. It takes me about 10 minutes to slam that thing. And I'm not kidding. 10 seconds after I slam that thing, I feel and I'm like, oh my, that was not a good choice. And for the rest of the night, I paid the price of eating an entire medium-sized Domino's pineapple pepperoni pizza in my bed in 10 minutes. It was not the best decision I ever made. Here's decision number two, also about food. Emma went grocery shopping for us yesterday. Love it. We haven't had, we, we, we didn't grocery shop for a minute. I was super excited, but she gave me a heads up. She came to me and she said, hey, I'm going to go grocery shopping and I need to tell you something. I was like, okay. And she said, I am not buying you any barbecue chips. And I said, thank you. Because here's what happened two weeks ago is I was hungry, hadn't eaten lunch. It's about nine o'clock. You see the theme here. I need to eat lunch more often. Uh, Open up the pantry and I was like, ooh, barbecue chips. And what did I do? I ran to my bed, got nice and comfy, turned on the TV and ate the entire bag of barbecue chips. The entire thing. 10 seconds later, And I leaned over to Emma and I was like, ooh, I'm not feeling so good. And she was like, well, how many chips did you eat? And I was like, the whole bag. And she was like, was it a snack size bag? And I said, nuh-uh. And she said, then that's why you feel bad. And I said, I just don't have self-control when I open up the barbecue chips. So she didn't buy me any because I will literally eat them until I'm sick. It's a decision that I make in the time. And I'm like, I'm hungry. That looks good. I'm doing it. And immediately, I regret it. And I think we can all think of decisions that we've made at one point or another where we're like, this is the best idea. I am 100% in on this. Nothing could be better. I couldn't be more sure on what I'm doing. And then all of a sudden, we feel that little brrrr. Maybe it's not your stomach, but you know what I'm talking about. And immediately, it was a bad decision. And while those stories are funny, Emma pointed something out to me a couple weeks ago. We were having a conversation, um, and and she said, you know, you, you like to do that. Not just when it comes to, to food. You like to really set your mind on something and, and just say, you know what? I'm 100% in. This is what I'm going to do. And you don't like to have your mind changed. You like to set your mind, decide what you're going to do, make that decision all in, and you don't like to change that stance. 
A lot of you guys have maybe heard uh, some of my story, some of my testimony before. I mean, it's a long story, and if I were to do the whole thing, we'd be here for a long time. But I do want to give you a piece of it, which is this. Um, back a few years ago now, when I met Emma, we, I, I wanted to date Emma. Um, and so we went to get coffee, and one of the first questions she asked was, hey, so like, do you believe in Jesus? Are you a Christian? And my quick and immediate response without hesitation was, no. Nope, I don't believe in that guy. No, thank you. I grew up in that household. I don't want nothing to do with it. I've seen what that looks like, and it's not for me. And here's the thing is, for months and months and months and months, Emma and I consistently had conversations about, hey, I enjoy dating you. You're a person I want to be around, but we can't get married if we don't believe the same thing. We need to talk about this. And we would have these deep conversations about what Emma believes and why she believes it. And I just kept coming to this point of, I've already set my mind on this. I've already made my decision that Jesus isn't for me. I already know that this is something that I don't want. I, I'm, I'm going to live a decently good life. I, I, I don't think that there's a hell, and if there is, I don't think I'm going to go to it, but I honestly really don't care because I'm just doing what I feel like doing. And we had tons of conversations about it. Then it came time that I wanted to uh, marry her. Wanted to marry her, and if you guys don't know, YPT is her dad, and it's customary to go ask the girl's dad, hey, can I marry your daughter? So I go to YPT. I, I go out to uh, breakfast at Gailey's, and I, we're sitting across the table, and I said, Hey, I think, I, I think you know what we're here to talk about. He said, I don't know if I do. What you got? And I said, well, I really like Emma, and I want to ask for your blessing to uh, marry her. And he said, do you have a relationship with Jesus? No, no, I don't. Okay. Have you read the Gospels? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I'm not interested in that. And he said, well, then we don't have much else to talk about. I can't give you my blessing to marry my daughter, but, but why don't you go home and read the Gospels? Why don't you go home and read the Gospels? Uh, come back and we'll have a conversation again. And so what I did is that night I went home and I read the Gospels in entirety. I read the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all in one setting in my bed at like midnight because it takes a while to read through all of the Gospels. It was a long reading night. Um, but, but here's what I found. As I look back, I think what Emma said is true, is that I can be quick to make my 100% decision and not want to budge, but I was wrong. I can, I can be quick to say, you know what, this is where I stand. This is what I believe. This is, this is, this is just what, who I am. I'm not going to change that. But I was wrong. And so tonight what I want to do is I just want to share with you the story that I read as I was reading through the Gospels. Well, there were a few stories that stood out to me, but I remember vividly, this is the story where I went. Maybe I'm not 100% right. Maybe, I 100%, maybe, maybe I'm all in on the wrong thing. Maybe, maybe I didn't get everything, and, and, and this is starting to make sense. I want to walk through this story with you guys, and, and it's in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me. Um, and, and, and I'm going to be honest, this is a little bit of a heavy story, but that's what grabbed my attention. That's what grabbed my attention, and I want to go through it with you tonight. Hopefully, you get something out of this tonight. In Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19, it says this, Jesus said, there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. Now, right off the bat, something I want to point out is that Jesus said, this is a story from Jesus during his time on earth, he's speaking this story straight from the mouth of Jesus. So we have this rich man who's, who's clothed in purple, and he lives each day in luxury. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there, longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. So here's the setting, is we have this rich man who has everything he could ever want. He's got his life figured out. He knows what he wants. He knows what he doesn't want. He's going to do what he wants, and he's not going to do what he doesn't want to do. And then we have Lazarus. We have the poor man sitting outside begging for scraps not even getting the scraps that he's begging for and instead getting licked by dogs. I can't even imagine the situation you have to get in to where you're being licked by dogs enough to be written about. That's where this dude is. 
It says in 22, finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. So, the, so Lazarus dies. Lazarus, the poor man, dies. And now we see he is at the side of Abraham at the heavenly banquet. But the rich guy also dies. The rich man also dies and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. My first point tonight is this. The place of the dead, he's talking about hell. This is Jesus talking about hell. He says, hey, Lazarus died and went to heaven. The rich man died and went to hell. My first point is that hell is a real place. Hell's a real place, and it's a real place that Jesus cares about so much that he's sitting here telling a story about it so that hopefully the people that hear it understand, hey, hell is a real reality. It's a place you don't want to go. We continue on in the story, and we see that he's going to kind of describe a little bit of what this hell looks like. But our first point tonight is that hell is an absolutely real, terrible place that many people end up in and that you don't want to go to. Hell is a real place. You're like, Miles, we started off laughing at, at food and it was light and now it got real heavy. We're talking about hell. And honestly, yes, it's gonna be, I told you it's gonna be a heavy lesson about hell. Why? Because I love you. And if we're gonna go through a series on gospel purpose, if we're going to talk about what the gospel should look like in our life and what Jesus has done for us and, and how we can get to heaven, then we have to talk about the other side of it, which is if we don't spend our eternity in heaven, we spend our eternity in hell. I love in Matthew chapter 10, 28, this verse just jumps out to me um, because it, it so clearly talks about hell as a real place. It says, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Again, hell is a real place. But we continue on in our story here. We continue on in the back half of verse 23. It says, they're in torment. So this is the rich man. He, he's, he's in hell now. And it says, they're in torment. He saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. So the rich man is in hell. And this hell is now described as torment. Torment is not something that I particularly want. Um, but we continue on in verse 24. And it says, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. So again, we see hell described as, as he's in anguish and there's flames. This place is sounding worse and worse and worse. It's not a place that we want to end up in. And, and, and the rich man is here like, hey, this is terrible. Would you send Lazarus over to just like dip his finger in some water and put it on my tongue. If, if he could just cool off my tongue, that's all I would need like to just get a little bit of relief because that's how bad it is. I'm not even asking to get out. I'm just asking for a little bit of help. And this is the response. But Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime, you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Now, I want to pause right here for just a second and point out, it talks about how, he says, remember, you had everything. Rich man, remember, you had everything, and Lazarus had nothing. And so now, you have nothing, and Lazarus is being comforted. But I want to point out here, I want to point out that this story is not saying, hey, because the rich man had a bunch of things, he went to hell. And because the poor man was poor and sick, he went to heaven. That's not what this is saying. If you remember back when the poor man begged, uh, or when Lazarus begged the rich man and said, hey, could I just have some table scraps? The rich man didn't do it. The rich man didn't give him the table scraps. What it shows is the condition of his heart. What we draw from this story is that the rich man did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But what we know is that if Lazarus is in heaven, then Lazarus had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think that's important to note. But as we, we go back to verse 26 real quick, it says, and besides, there is a great chasm separating us. 
No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Our second point tonight is that hell is eternal separation from God. Hell is eternal separation from God. Second Thessalonians says it this way. In chapter 1, verse 9, it says, They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. He's begging for help. And Abraham's answer is, man, I'd love to help you, but I can't reach you. I'd love to get over there to you, but no one crosses. If you're in hell, you're in hell. And if you're in heaven, you're there for good. No one crosses because hell is eternal separation from heaven, eternal separation from where God is, and there is no crossing it. We pick up in verse 27, it says, then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. So again, we have the rich man begging here. The rich man's like, fine, I get it. I'm stuck here. This is eternal anguish. Would you at least go warn my family? I have people on earth that I care about. I don't want this to be their reality. I don't want them to end up in hell. Would you at least go talk to them? And I, I think the point that we, that we draw from this so quickly is that we should warn everyone that we know about the seriousness of hell. See, this is where we see the rich man, it starts to click for him. This is where the rich man starts to understand. Maybe he's regretting the decision that he had made in the way that he lived his life. Maybe he was a little bit wrong. You know, he was all in about getting money and having status and power and living this luxurious life. Maybe that wasn't the right focus to have. It's starting to click, and so what he realizes is, man, I need to warn everybody I know. I need to go tell everyone I know because I don't want this to be their reality. I care about them. I love them. I don't want the people that I love to spend their eternity in hell. But we continue on in verse 29. It says, but Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, they will repent of their sins and turn to God. Listen to this. Listen to verse 31. It says, but Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Now, the first time I read that, I had a couple questions, but as I was studying it, it clicked. You know what Abraham is saying here? Abraham's saying, you want me to go warn them, but actually, they already have every warning they need. They have the word of God. And if they're willing to read the word of God, to hear the word of God, to have the word of God told to them, and that's still not enough to move them. That's still not enough for them to respond. That's still not enough for them to recognize, man, maybe I am a sinner, and maybe I don't want to go to hell. Then bringing someone back to life wouldn't change their mind either. Again, that takes me back to my story where I, I sit and I read the Gospels all the way through, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and I come across this story and I start to realize, think back to when the rich man began to realize like, oh man, maybe I don't have it right. I thought that this Christian life wasn't for me. Maybe I'm wrong. The difference is the rich man realized it too late. The difference is the rich man realized, man, I'm on the wrong side of this, after he had already gotten to hell. But praise God, that's not my story. Praise God, I read this and said, oh man, I don't want to go to hell. Oh man, that scares me. But here's the thing, I didn't stop there. I didn't just go, oh man, hell scares me. Oh man, I want to get out a hell free card. No, what that turned into is, so how, what, what do I do? If I, don't wanna, if I don't wanna go to hell, what do I do? What does it look like to get out of hell? And I started studying and I started reading more. And as I got through it, this is what I found is that we still have the chance to make a decision for Christ. You still have a chance to make a de decision for Christ tonight. You here tonight still have a decision 
that you could make. If you haven't made a decision to follow Christ, if you haven't said, Jesus, I recognize that you are the Lord of my life, that, that you came to this earth to die for my sins, and I ask that you would come into my life. If you haven't made that decision yet, you still have the chance. And, and it gets so hard to talk about hell as I sit here and say, yeah, it's fiery torment. It's forever separation from God. And it starts to sound really bad and really scary. And my goal tonight is not to stand here and to scare you and, and, and to make you so afraid of hell. My goal here is to warn you. And that was Jesus' goal too in telling this story. He doesn't want to cause fear, but he wants to say, hey, I know what the reality is, and I'm not content in letting you die and go to hell. I know how bad this place is, and I can't let that happen because I love you. And that's where I come to you guys tonight. If you're in this room and you don't know if you have a relationship with Christ, if when you're asked the question, hey, if you died tonight, where would you go? If you don't know 100% that you would end up in heaven, then I'm talking to you tonight because I love you and I care about you and I do not want to see what happened to the rich man happen to the people in this room. But Jesus says, that's the reality. If you die without a relationship with Christ, you spend an eternity in hell. But thank God that we serve a God that loves us. We don't serve a God that's looking to just put us in hell. We serve a God who loves us, who wants a relationship with us, who wants to know us. And so God's not content with just letting all of us go to hell. No, he sends his son Jesus to earth. John 3, 16 says it like this. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have in eternal life. Second Peter 3, 9 says it this way. He says, he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. And it's so simple. It's so simple. Romans 10, 9, it says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you guys would bow your heads and close your eyes, every head bow, every eyes closed. I want to ask you guys tonight to be completely honest right now. No one's looking around the room, but this is me asking you for real. Do you have a relationship with Christ? Do you know? Do you know? Are you 100% sure you have a relationship with Christ? Maybe you walked in the room tonight and you were 100% sure that you didn't need Christ. Man, I've been there. Maybe you walked in, you're like, you know, I don't know if I 100% am against it, but I don't know if I'm 100% for it. I don't know how you came in the room tonight, but I know how you could leave. I know that you have the opportunity to leave this room tonight knowing that if you were to die, you'd spend eternity in heaven with Jesus forever. So tonight, if you can't think of a time that, that you asked Jesus into your life, but you wanna do that for the first time, it's as easy as just confessing with your heart in believing that Jesus is who he says he is. If you wanna do that for the first time tonight, would you just be bold and raise your hand? Would you raise your hand and say, I've never done that in my life, but tonight I wanna change that. Tonight I wanna know that if I were to die, I'd spend my eternity in heaven with God. Thank you. If you raise your hand, would you just pray this prayer with me? Dear God, thank you that you love us so much that, that you saw us as broken and sinful, and you saw that our reality was eternity in hell, but you weren't content to leave it that way. God, thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to this earth. Thank you. Thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to live a perfect and sinless life and to die on the cross for my sins. And tonight, I ask that you would come into my life and save me. Tonight, I want to know 100% with certainty that I will spend my eternity in heaven with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.